All right, this is the follow-up, and we are following up on a number of panel discussions that I had on George's base chat entitled Diversify Your Efforts. My guest today on the follow-up is none other but the mighty Ralph Roll, drummer extraordinaire in New York City and owner um, of Soul Snacks Cookies. Ralph, thank you so much for making yourself available, and welcome to the follow-up. George, thank you so much for having me. This is really nice. Awesome. Awesome. Well, listen, um, to give um, you and the people listening and watching some context um, in the uh, panel discussions of uh, diversifying your efforts, I had musicians on who not only had a full workload as a musician, but who have also branched out um, in different businesses, sometimes mm. close to the music business, sometimes far removed from the music business. Um, mm. I thought it would be great to have Ralph on today because not only is he a fantastic drummer, um, longtime uh, drummer and associate of Chic with Nile Rodgers, um, and, uh, but he also branched out and started a business called Soul Snacks Cookies. Now, let me hand it over to you, Ralph. Um, why don't you give us somewhat of a background um, of your drumming and also of the idea of starting this cookie business? Also, right. I should I should add that Ralph is the first guest ever on uh, the follow up who has branched out into the food industry, which I find fascinating. So please mm -hmm. go ahead, Ralph. Yeah, um, well, the drumming for me started at a very young age. Um, I grew up in, um, in the Bronx, where, right. um, I'm, I'm just so Bronx, it's ridiculous. And my brother, my older brother was the drummer, my brother, Howie. Right. Uh, so w one day, um, it, when I came home in our bedroom, there was a drum set set up and what made it a little odd for me as even at that age is my mother, my mother, Rose, Rose Roll was very strict lady. Mm. Mm. Uh, she was a single parent, um, right. and I was the youngest, the youngest of four. Wow. So it was my older sister, my brother, my other sister, Yvonne, uh, and me. Right. So her way of making sure that we weren't get, going to get in any trouble because she worked a lot was to get us in all types of activities. Right. And, and at that particular time, my brother uh was uh a bad boy oh wow. for her for okay. her okay um and growing up you know in in the city in the city growing up in, in the projects and when your parents aren't around obviously an idle mind is the devil's playground so i know the reason why later on i figured out she let him have drums in the bedroom because she knew where he was going to be right of course in the bedroom yeah. So the fact that I idolized my brother so much, I just wanted to do everything that he did. Mm. So I wanted to, to play drums. And right. he said to me, you can play, but you're left-handed, don't change the drums around. And I would just sit down and just play. And that's how I ended up uh, being an open-handed drummer. He, right. he, gave, he gave up drums early on mm. and started a family. And believe it or not, he just celebrated him and his wife their 50th wedding anniversary well there you go yeah so, so you talk, talking about in love yeah fantastic <laughs> and, no. you know he's now he's a, he's a retired uh, mechanical engineer wow. which uh, he's done very well for himself but i kept up the drums and being the youngest and when he started on with his life um it was just my sisters and my mother and me in the house right so she taught uh she taught her boys everything that the girls did. We knew how to sew, we knew how to cook, we knew how to do all house chores. Right. Um, and she made that same thing for the girls because they played softball and basketball and volleyball. And, yeah. you know, they, they, it was just a very equal opportunity household that my mother created. Um, and all of my brothers and sisters went on to be very successful. And that's what, uh, what, what my mother wanted. Right. But one of the things that my grandmother and my mother used to do is they, they, they used to bake and cook like most families, you know, right. you, it wasn't growing up in the inner city, uh, growing up in the projects, it was the norm to have great cooks because there was not any extra money to go to restaurants on a regular basis. Right. You know, so. 
I stayed up under my mother and my grandmother watching them bake. Mm. And I just found a love for it. And 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 then, you know, it, it worked out for me because I was a shy kid. Mm. So the thing that I would do if I met a girl, um, I would bake something, you know, re- re- super corny. <laughs> But it's pretty it, smooth, it, you know, dude. Yeah, it, yeah that's, I, that's, I realized, that's really I, smooth. <laughs> I realized that later on that it that it, that it worked, <laughs> but <laughs> but all of my friends that I hung out with at the time, you know, it, it were all musicians, but they were a lot cooler than me. You know, mm-hmm. the only one that was kind of equal to me as far as personality was a, a keyboard player named Kenny Drew Jr. Mm-hmm. And you might know his father, Kenny Drew Senior, is a jazz pianist. He was amazing. So. Yeah. Uh, if if you don't know who he is, guys, look just Google Kenny Drew Jr. and Senior, and he has some amazing music. Um, but uh, the baking stuck for me; it mm. really was something that I enjoyed doing. So, while I was drumming, uh, after my mother passed away, I turned my one of the bedrooms in my apartment into a production studio, wow. and my partners would come over, and and luckily. When we started the company, we kind of hit the ground running doing jingles right. uh, for a woman uh, named Debbie McDuffie. Right. And she gave us uh, Dark and Lovely and Cadillac and, and, and all these other great commercials that we would do for her. And one day when we were creating some music, I said, let me go, I'm gonna go uh, bake some cookies. And my partners, uh, Gerard Harmon, who's, they're, they're my brothers to be honest with you, Gerard Harmon, Mm. And Armando Colon, who was still very much involved in the uh, music business and mm. uh, entertainment, they looked at me like I was out of my mind. You know, like why are you going to bake cookies? It's just so it's just so random. Yeah. So I baked the cookies. I brought them back in the studio, and then it was like, okay, you need to have these all the time. Like everywhere we go, you need to have these cookies. Now this this was around nineteen uh, ninety wow. ninety one is when is when that I started baking in the house. And then my girlfriend moved in. Right. And you know, uh, what we decided to do for the holidays because we didn't have any money was to bake cookies for our friends. I suggested baking cookies for our friends and we did. And we went downtown to the, behind Macy's on 34th Street, it was a 99 cent store. And we bought these holiday tins and you know, we stuffed them with the cookies and, and we, we gave it the crazy name. We called them ghetto cookies. And the reason why, <laughs> the reason why I decided to call him, we were my 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 ex girlfriend and mm. was from the projects too, right? And I'm from the projects, and at that particular time, we were doing a lot of, of work. I was working at the Apollo, mm. uh, which uh, by that time, and um, doing a lot of different things. And she was a Juilliard graduate. Wow. So we just, the reason why we called it Ghetto Cookies is because we're both kind of from the quote unquote ghetto, but right. we wanted to show some positivity. Yeah, and, and how ghetto has gotten such a negative con- connotation, right. but it's also spawned some of the greatest uh, talent and 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 genres yeah. when That's... you come out of that type of environment. So it was fun. So There's anyway, culture. It, There's yes, culture. Exactly. You know? So so we sent the cookies out, and every single it was thirty six friends and family, and every single person got back in touch and said, "Man, these cookies are amazing. You should think about selling them." Wow. And now at at that moment, I'm, I'm like I said, I'm at the Apollo, but every night of the week I'm working, right. which is which is very which important is a, for any musician. Yeah. I'm doing Nell's open mic. I'm doing Sylvia's also open mic. I'm doing gigs on the weekend. I'm doing Wednesday night at the Apollo. Right. And, you know, having a, another business at that time just wasn't an idea until people said, you know what? You should give it a try, and I and I thought that was the message. Right. So we did. Right. Um. At at the open mic at Sylvia's, which and now Melba, I don't know if you know Melba's restaurant. Oh yeah. Hall, a very yeah. famous restaurant. She's been my friend forever, and I called and said, "Listen, we're thinking about selling cookies." She said, "Bring them in." And at that point, so ill prepared, we didn't know what to do. We didn't know about sticky labels. We had school glue with paper, and mm. I printed out this really crazy logo of, of the, the the building that I lived in with a rainbow. It was just a mess. Mm. But we brought the cookies in, we gave our samples. Shelby, Shelby J, who, who sings with, uh, who used to sing with uh, Prince right. and um, and uh, D'Angelo was right. the MC for the night. Right. Uh, and also Mike Phillips, who, who also played with Prince and has his own records out as well. 
Mm. We were all in the band uh, at the time. So give out the cookies, everyone buys the cookies. And a guy sitting at the, at the bar was from a magazine called YSB that mm. was owned by BET uh, uh, television. Right. Yeah. And he said, would you like to do an article? Because this is, this, is, this is really good. So I, I told him our backstory and he really loved it. Mm. Again, not being prepared. I didn't have a, a pager. Everyone had a pager at the time. I didn't have one. Right. So I called my sister and she had one of those pages with the pin number on it. And I said, we're doing an article. Can I use it? She said, yeah, you probably get a couple of phone calls. Well, the article came out. Mm -hmm. And her pager rang. She says, oh, you got a call for cookies. So she, I wrote it down. Then a few minutes later, she says, okay, you got a couple more. So for about a month, we were getting calls, 10, 20, 30 calls a day about cookies now to sell. Unbelievable. Un un it was unbelievable. So now we had to quickly move out of our apartment to another space. And, and my friend Artie was a drummer. Um, mm -hmm. and his brother Patrice, who, who's not in the industry at all. I asked Patrice, could you ask your mother if I can uh, rent her uh, space at, in her brownstone because it was, it was vacant. Right. He said, to, his mother was a lot like mine. She was very strict. He said, I'm not asking him, you ask him. So, <laughs> so, so I went across the street and I said, Ms. Durant, this is what I'm doing. I got to gut the kitchen. I got to put in a convection oven and a vent and a three tub sink. And I got to bring in all these supplies. And wow. she listened to the whole thing. And she looked at me, she said, okay, you can do it. Wow. And okay. that was my first, that was our first official uh, facility, if you will. Right. Um, right. From there, uh, we ended up being on uh, the TV Food Network. We got mm -hmm. a call from the New York Times. I actually hung up on the woman because mm -hmm. I thought it was a prank call. Mm. Uh, because we had just been on N uh, a on NBC News or right. CBS News, right. so we were getting all this press. So I didn't, I, you know, people were just calling. Some people were calling and hanging up, whatever. Right. But I thought the woman from the New York Times was a prank, <laughs> and so I hung up on her. And she called back, and they they actually came over did an article, mm. New York Times, and but the big article came uh, when we ended up in Family Circle magazine. Right. That was actually during the time we actually did TV Food Network. So we started getting all this great press because it was a great backstory, right. which is, is a very important component of what I, I want to you know, eventually talk about. Right. Um, right. From there, we had to move again to a bigger space. Right. My girlfriend and I, uh, she decided she didn't want to have anything to do with the cookies anymore. Mm. Now I'm on TV, I'm doing more gigs, and I'm still trying to hold on to my business. Right. And I couldn't, it was just right. too much. Right. So right. I had to shut down for a while and mm. knowing I was going to start back. Right. Um, and I did start back finally with, with, with my, my um, wife. Right. Um, and we, we kind of took off from there. Right. Right. Um, right. And that's the kind of condemned quick story. We have a, we have a 1250 foot uh, square foot factory now. Yeah. We bake for some big clients. Right. Uh, we do a lot of internet sales. Uh, and there's some other great things going on that I'll I'll, uh, I'll tell you about uh, as we go along. Yeah, no, I mean, and let me let me, you know let me jump in at this point because also I wanted to give the the audience somewhat of a context of how we met. Um, we played um, a gig together at the Apollo Theater, and uh, between and this is a real life story. I hope I'm not embarrassing you, but um, I need to tell this because it's it it it, it was significant to wit witness that right um we started off having a, a rehearsal i believe early afternoon or maybe in the morning um three o'clock say three o'clock yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah so we had the rehearsal um we played a rehearsal and then there's usually some downtime between rehearsal and the gig right mm -hmm. um in that downtime musicians go to the dressing room get dressed uh, have dinner whatever right ralph roll gets dressed and says, okay, I got to go to my factory and pick up an order of cookies and uh, bring them to a client, right? And at that point, my mind was blown, right? There were so much, so many things happening in that one statement. I got to go to my factory. Who says that? Who, who has a factory, right? <laughs> I got to go to my factory, pick up my truck and deliver cookies to my client. 
okay this so at that so just to give the audience some context like this is real right this is as real as it gets all right so ralph let me uh open it up to you um what i try <laughs> to <laughs> this is a true story i mean this, no, this I, and I, I know i know i've done it so many times it's just, i'm just <laughs> laughing because it's kind of unbelievable, but I would I would literally run out the back door and go and and deliver to get back to you know, uh, yeah. showtime. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. So let me open it up to you uh, with this question or with this um, uh, idea. Uh, our business, the music business, has changed tremendously, right? You could say it has done a one eighty. Um, whereas you know, twenty, thirty, forty years ago, especially with New York is concerned. Um, the big studios sort of ruled the scene. Um, there was a lot of recording work happening here. There were budgets for albums. There was jingle work. There was all sorts of work happening, right? Um, in the meantime, that has shifted. I, 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 I'm not a big fan of saying that the studio work just isn't there anymore, but I believe that it has shifted. It has shifted to at home recording it has shifted to, you know, pretty much everybody producing their tracks by themselves, sending them away. And, and doing work that way, right? right. Um, as a sign of the time that our business has changed, wouldn't mm. it behoove us, and this was sort of the assertion that I, I that started the diversify your efforts idea, um, wouldn't it behoove us as musicians to also adapt our definition of what it means to be a musician in terms of, yes, we do a full workload as a, as a performer, as a recording artist, as whatever, but at the at the same time, we also branch out and do other business. What is your take on that? Uh, well, if you remember back in the seventies mm. when the digital age showed up, right? Um, the the first instrument, digital instrument that I saw was a Yamaha DX7, right? And at that moment, I'm like, the world is about to end because this is the worst sound I've ever heard. That was just me personally. Right. And I was in the studio when I heard it. I was actually a quad recording when I heard it. I was like, you know, the keyboard player was losing his mind over it. And I'm mm. going, this thing sounds horrible. Mm. And then one of the first uh, drum machines that I was exposed to was uh, with the Oberheim DMX. Right. right. And for some strange reason, at that moment, something hit me. Mm. And what hit me was the fact that the world is never going to be what it used to be right. from this point forward. The, the digital age and all the things that we imagined as kids, you know, from a watch on the arm like Dick Tracy is going to possibly come, you know, to, to fruition at some right. point. Right. So in I, 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 there's a, there's a movie that says you better get your mind right. And I, that line always stuck out for me, but right. at that point I started to embrace the digital side and a lot of my drummer friends were not really as interested in the digital, uh, drum machines and learning about mm. these things as I was, mm. because I knew if you needed to go into a studio, the more equipped you were, the better off you were. Right. So I, I started learning how to program like all the drum machines at the time right. that, that were coming out, the Oberheim, the, the Rollins, uh, everything. Right. And it, it, it was a good idea. So expanding your mind then is not necessarily a plan B because I don't right. believe in plan Bs at all. I, right. I, I tell every person that I teach this no, to me is plan A because yeah. plan B gets in the way of plan A because you're thinking that there's something else to so-called fall back on. That's not what it is. Right. You can have a plan A and a plan A.1. Right. And right. that is the thinking about how I uh, uh, wanted to move forward. Right. So, so being open-minded and realizing that there are other opportunities and other passions yeah. that are just important as your musician passion is, is a great thing. Right. Um, it's just the biggest thing is finding the time to do both. Um, you had mentioned something about being um, when we were coming up. You played this instrument, and that's all you played, right? Um, which is is kind of the same thinking from that generation. Because when I became a drummer, and maybe you, as a bass player, when I became a drummer, my mother came from 
a job. You right. got to get a job. Right. You get a job, you find some benefits. You get a job, you stay in that job, you retire. And right. that's, how, that's how the thinking, it was very municipal kind of training yeah. as far as how you thought. It wasn't much necessarily entrepreneurial because that's a danger zone. Right. Being a musician is definitely being an entrepreneur. Yeah. It is a very risk-taking position. So you already, in my opinion, we all have the passion anyway. Yeah. 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 Because we, we dive in deep water into yeah. something that we love without worrying about how other people thought. And in cases like ours, you become successful at it and you then turn other people onto how you became successful. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so what I so 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 based on what 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 the what you're asking me there there are so many things that we have the ability to do right. you just have to pick the 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 idea as to whether or not this is something that you're ready to long haul right. because i know the day that i became a musician i was following my brother uh into mechanical engineering and was um, filling out the application to go to pratt institute right and in my fourth year of drafting as a young kid, and I was I was pretty smart kid. I got skipped a year and was, was going to get out early. I was sitting in class and I literally, I can remember it like yesterday and still feel it. I went, what am I doing here? Mm -hmm. I can't see myself doing this for the rest of my life. I, I want to be a drummer. Right. And I went home with excitement to tell my mother that I made this career choice, like this serious career choice. And all she did was look at me and said, you know what, I just, I think you just lost your mind. Like, <laughs> that was, she said, are you okay? I said, no, I, I want to be a musician. Yeah. And she was like, that's not, that's not a job. Mm. That's, that's just something you do. Mm. And mm. she didn't understand. And, and she was, tr you know, trying to protect. And I know many of your listeners have probably heard the same thing. Oh yeah. You know, especially the older musicians of my age, they probably heard it too, because you know, coming up in America as a minority, there wasn't a lot of real, real opportunities. Right. Um, so getting a job, a solid job somewhere was what people, you know, inspired. And, and, and guess what? There was nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Because they were trying to protect their family and feed their families. Of course. We, of course. we the next generation, was lucky enough to have the ability to actually stretch out and move right. on and do other things that we, we wanted. Yeah, you were um, able to build is, on on whatever happened before. This right, absolutely, right, and yeah. that's what we want. That's what I want for my daughter. That's of what course. we want for our children as we grow. So, but I don't look at Plan Bs. Right, 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 right. I think that's well, a that's sorry to interrupt you, and and I won't. I'll keep this brief. But I think that's an incredible takeaway. Um, that's uh, I I I liken it somewhat to. Um, when I first started working in construction, um, I was doing eight hours a day on various construction sites, doing everything from sheetrocking to plumbing to electrical to everything, right? right. Um, I learned how to build houses. That's, that's what I did, right? And um, after the eight hours, went home, took a shower, and went and played a show, and went and sat in somewhere, and stayed out all night, making connections, and, you know, doing what you need to do. I think... It speaks to your point of making the time and finding whatever, whatever it is that, since we are multifaceted beings, whatever it is that sort of sparks our interest, sparks our creativity, and going into it. But please continue. I just wanted to to add that to to what you just said. Well, well, and and it's very important because the whole time while you were doing your work, you were thinking about the, the Music. passion. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, passion has no plan B yeah. and passion has no expiration date. Yeah. Um, and when, when I started, when I finally met my wife and we started the cookie company back, we started exactly the same way right. that I started in the beginning. Right. One oven, one rack at a time right. and one client. My very first client was Melba. I went back yeah. to Melba and said, I'm restarting the company. Can I sell it? At the, at the time, she had a, a, a cafeteria um, in the state office building on 125th Street. Right. And I would sell to her. And then my very next client was, uh, was Dougie Fresh. We had a restaurant. <laughs> Incredible. So starting over again wasn't like, oh, God, I got to start over again. It was, it was, to me, 
the fact that she was now a part of the business and really loved what we were doing and saw mm. saw the light, actually right. saw the vision of what, what I had uh, thought of before. We started uh, getting more clients, more stores. We were in many delis and cafes and restaurants throughout Manhattan. Right. Um, and at the time, our daughter was only three years old. And we would, the babysitter was right next door. Mm. So we would, we would get her, you know, ready for the babysitter. We would take her next door. And, and then we would work for uh, 10 straight hours once we got to the incubator and then pick her up in the morning, mm. get her ready for her day. Mm. And then she would start back baking uh, here in the kitchen again. So it was back and forth, back and forth. And we hardly got any sleep, but we knew we had a good product and we yeah. knew we had something good. We changed the name to Soul Snacks. Right. Um, and then from that point, uh, we started getting uh, even more accounts and uh, more notoriety. And I got an offer to uh, do an interview in Japan. Oh. Um, uh, my friend's, uh, his name is Soul Searcher. That's what they call him. It's, mm. uh, Masa, Masahado is his name. And he does this soul show. And he has a lot of listeners. And we right. started talking about the cookies. At the time, I was playing with this big artist called Toshi. Right. Toshi Kubota is a, a, a superstar in Japan. And I was his uh, 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 band leader at the time. The guy, um, me and, excuse me, me and Masahado, we do the interview. And a guy calls me from the studio and says, Masahado wants to talk to you. Mm. And he puts him on the phone. He says, um, there's just, someone wants to meet you. And he's, he's a vice president of a store called Sabu, which mm. is like our Macy's. And I said, fine. So I call my manager who speaks Japanese, gets on the phone with him. And we sit down and we have a meeting with him and his three, his two vice presidents. And um, he doesn't speak any English. He's he, what I always remembered. He dressed like Chaz Palminteri. He was the coolest guy, and he was very nice. And he he was very business. He said, "Okay, let's get to it." So he tried the cookies. He said something, and everyone in the room laughed, but me because I didn't understand what he said. And I'm talking belly laugh. Right, right. So I'm sitting there trying to feel normal, and I I lean over to my translator, and she's laughing, and. He, I said, what, 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 what did he say? He said, listen, he, he says, I just wanted to let him know that I was a fan and I wanted to meet him, but I didn't think the cookies would taste nearly this good. And that's, <laughs> so that, that ended up uh, getting us into Sable department store. Right. So what I'm trying to say in all of this is if there's anybody out there that, that, that is uh, thinking about doing something, please do not talk yourself out of, out of possible greatness right. you know you i when i do my master classes one of the places i sit on for a while because i realized that when i do classes it's more about the psychological approach than the physical mm. and it's, it's breaking those mental attitudes to help you to grow as a musician right. because i find that many musicians doubt themselves so much that they don't give themselves a chance to grow or they don't get out of their own way. Right. So my point is, if you have something that you've been passionate about other than music, you don't want to get to a certain age and say, what if? Yeah. That is, to me, is one of probably the most painful things that you could do for yourself right. is to know that you have this idea. Right to do something and you never attempted it because my philosophy is success is not paved in how much money you make. It's in finishing the thought. Think about your life, George. You yeah. were construction eight hours a day. You bust your hump. Yeah. Okay. But you made sure that your passion kept that front seat no matter what, oh, yeah. how tired you were. Yep. You got out there and you got into the scene and you did. So, so you, that's what passion does. That's what feeling that I have something here that the world could appreciate is important. And yep. you really don't, you know, I have, you and I both have friends yeah. who were amazing musicians who, you know, didn't make it. And it wasn't necessarily because they couldn't play. 
Right. Right. It, it was it had to do with more of their mental attitude about themselves. Yeah. And what if they don't like me? And what if, all of these what ifs, all of these anxieties. Yeah. And that's why I do my master classes mostly on the mental approach, the mental application. Right. So as far as the cookies are concerned, fast forward. When I met you, we we uh, we went from the incubator. We found our own space. We hired uh, a bunch of employees, and we started opening up and doing more um, more stores. There were times when the dis the distributor couldn't get to a place, and that's what you saw. I had to go and do it, right. and I was fine with it. It was never like, oh, I gotta go. I was like, okay, I gotta go deliver my product. You know, this is my product. I gotta go get it out there, yeah. and then I gotta get back to the uh the theater no and you could feel that you could feel that believe me i was on the on the other right. side of that that conversation or i was in yeah. that room you could feel there was no regret there was yeah, no, no there was no no sighing there was no oh my god i gotta do this there was right. none of that there was if if anything <clears throat> what what i got from from you saying i gotta go to my factory and all that it was it was also there was no boasting you know let, yeah. let, let's be let's be very clear about this right what I got out of it was excitement. Like, well, it, this it, is it, great. Yeah, it's, that's it's what I got out exciting. of it. It's true. Well, thank you, know? you, man. Yeah, it's still very exciting. And um, from from the Soul Snacks brand, um, what we what we had done next is in Japan. We went from the Sable department store to our own three story store in in Ginza, um, which lasted about a year, and then the. Uh, the people that brought us over, they opened up five other stores and mm. it was right next door to each other in Ginza. And if anybody knows Ginza, it's probably some of the most um, expensive real estate in the world. Mm. And they did have a lot of money, but the money was running out and they didn't have a good marketing uh, uh, scheme. Right. Uh, so I started to do my own thing. And one of the things I did is I, I did a block party mm. and I had a radio show and, a, and a, a, a blog from mm -hmm. that I was going to turn into a, a TV show. My first guest was Vanessa Williams, wow. which was amazing. And I, I thank her all the time for doing that. But they ran out of money when I was away and they had to shut all of the stores down at the same time. Mm -hmm. But um, the, the good thing is, is that we got a, a footprint in another country, which I use that as forward motion marketing. Incredible. Right? And then um, we came home and I took all of that information and started shopping around. And then my wife and I opened a restaurant um, we, we had, right before COVID and the mm -hmm. restaurant closed during COVID. And then we opened the restaurant again and then the new variant hit and we just closed December 25th again. Mm -hmm. But all of these ups and downs are, are to me never negative. Right. They're learning experiences that you take with you, you figure out what you've done because if it didn't happen i wouldn't have something to learn from right you know what i mean yeah yeah, yeah. every every experience that's a failure is a positive i can tell you that right. it is a positive to learn from and grow from right. so now we bank for chase bank right. we have we bank for one of the biggest caterers that does all of the theaters which is great performances right um we bank for woman skating rink now and we just signed a deal with Walmart and we are rolling out in March 1st to 800 Walmart stores and Kroger is days away from giving us their numbers too. That is so, incredible. Congratulations. That's, that's just amazing. That's, that's, I mean, you. anyone who, who, who watches this, who listens to this needs to understand that first of all, Walmart is an, in, in, an incredibly large entity right yeah uh kroger's not so perhaps not so much in in new york or the tri-state area but once you go into the midwest the, the kroger's is everywhere right you, yeah. you cannot like i have real estate in in detroit you cannot not see kroger's anywhere this right. it's it's all over the place so that is huge right yeah thank you very much i mean yeah. passion has no expiration date right it's, it's not about the sprint, it's about the marathon. Right. We have been at this for 27 years and I wouldn't trade a single day mm. of whatever went on good, bad, or indifferent for anything else, for a quick, for something quick. Right. Because honestly, 
this journey with the cookies and with business and with music has never been a more, it's never been about me more than it's been about how I could pass it forward. Right. You know, I teach kids and adults all over the world because I am trying my best to change how a person thinks about themselves, no matter where you come from. And believe me, I've been fortunate enough to teach in Africa and Asia and and in all over Europe. And it's it's just me trying to pass the message forward Mm. to be able to change how people see themselves Mm. behind their instrument and behind their lives. Because it right. spans further, like for yourself. Look at you. Yeah. You're 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 you you're an entrepreneur, yeah. and you play on Broadway, and and both of them take the front seat. Yeah. You know, uh, and that's a beautiful thing. And and I have a a, a friend of mine, a very close friend of mine in in, um, in California. His name is Herman Matthews. He's, a, he's an amazing drummer. Yeah. And Herman has a peanut butter brittle, peanut brittle company, peanut butter. Uh, company and he sent me some of his brittle and his really good stuff so my plan is to reach out to him now again and talk to him about his company and start uh, cultivating um, other musicians uh, uh, food uh, entrepreneur attitudes if you will and try to help them to move their product along and get them involved in some of the things that that I'm doing yeah, but it, you, you know, yeah, it's, it's important, people. Follow your passions. Do not be afraid of it. You know, you don't want to say what if you. Failure is is not trying. Success. Right. It, success has to do all, with finishing the thought. Yeah. Not yeah. how much money you make. No. Not most... how much money you make. It's finishing the thought. Then you're successful. Yeah. The first time that we, walked into Melba's. 27 years ago and people liked the product we was a success because we got it out of our kitchen into the hands of other people to see how they liked it and how they appreciate it right 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 no that's that is that is so deep and that's that's such an important takeaway from from this conversation and in in general from uh, trying to or from from having I, I don't i don't actually i don't like saying trying to but having some sort of entrepreneurial uh thoughts um, in your in your psyche in your mind, um, very very important takeaway. There was one thing that I and I don't want to keep you too long. I, I, no, no, I, it's I fine. Am, it's <laughs> fine. But there was one thing that I wanted to get to come back to, and that that was sort of um, the you you mentioned earlier of how do you see yourself, right? Um, the importance of how how seeing yourself can influence whatever business you're going into, be it music, be it whatever else, right? Um, and I'm going to tie that in with, yes, with our background of being told, okay, you need one job and one job only, right? And I do, I, I when you said it just a couple moments ago, like the, the hair stood up on, on the back of my neck because I do know the people who, you know, because of that mindset, are keeping themselves back right um and 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 great musicians all the way around no doubt about that but just not able to see themselves in a different way in a positive way in a uplifting way right um and i thought that perhaps the idea of branching out and sort of Admitting to yourself that number one, you are a multifaceted being. You are, you have different interests, right? And you can do different things at the same time. Can, in terms, sort of um, build a positive feedback, positive self-image feedback um, that people can build on, right? Um, so I wanted to get your thoughts on that because I really think that, especially for musicians, for performing artists, uh, it's important to be able to step outside of yourself and see yourself, see, basically see yourself with, with the eyes of the audience that came to see you, right? Because, I mean, mm. they obviously love something about you. So why sh- you, we should probably love something about ourselves as well. Okay, so, you know, as 
as musicians, as singers, as anyone in the entertainment industry, dancers, anyone that's in front of an audience. Right. Um, when you're first starting out, the, the level of, of uh, anxiety and, and, and butterflies right. that you get is, is huge. Yeah. Because you want to do the best job possible. And the biggest thing is you don't want to embarrass yourself in the process. Right. So uh, that's why you, you, know, you would get butterflies. I mean, those, those left a long time ago when I learned uh, a technique. Hold on a second before, hold on, hold on. Um, I just realized I didn't plug in my computer and I don't want it to go dead. Oh. <laughs> in the midst of our conversation, this would take all of three seconds to do. No worries, no worries, we're not. Um, I, I, I swear, I just realized, I looked out of my computer and went, oh no. Okay, so we're in. Um, <laughs> what, what, what happens to us is that we get butterflies when we're playing in front of an audience because you know we're doing something that we love and we want to be really great at it. Right. Um, but but the thing that I spoke about before is that what if factor. Right. What if factor is is something that you will literally talk yourself out of being great. Yeah. By saying you know the big one is what if they don't like me. Yeah. Um, well, the answer to that is well th probably there's a percentage of the audience that won't. And that's right. just the way life is. Right. You know, when I first started the cookie company, every time someone would buy the cookie, I would look at them like this, like with fear, because I don't know what they were going to say. And then I realized, Ralph, you cannot please everybody. That's right. just an impossibility. Right. You know, you want it. Everybody's not going to like your product. Everybody's not going to like your drumming. Everybody's not going to like your singing. Right. But you you have to like you more than that and and it's not necessarily ego mm. but it's just having the, the the pride to go you know what pass or fail i did it right they tasted it pass or fail i played it right. i did my best i didn't half step it i worked on it hard right. so when you start giving yourself that self-confidence you you'll start to realize that that what if factor starts to go away because right. it's not so much about what if they don't like me and what if i fail it what if this and what if that? No, you. Those mental exercises are. Your mind is like any other muscle, and if you don't exercise it and in the proper way, it will atrophy. Yeah. And and it will. You, these these anxieties will start to compound each other before you know it. You're backing yourself into corners that you're comfortable with being in. Right. Because that's what you've done to yourself. Yeah. You know, on top of the fact that all it takes is some one person you love to turn that switch off too. Right. Uh, my friend and I, Gerard, uh, like I told you, he's, he's we've known each other for so long. He's in California now. Right. And he's pitching a new TV show. And it's a beautiful thing to watch the fact that he's constantly pushing, constantly going forward to do what he does and never getting in his own way, no matter what anyone thinks. Right. And that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. You know, so I say to anyone out there who is feeling like the, the, the door has stopped or they're at the finish line or the red light will not change to green, mm. you got to find ways to get out of your own way. That what if the, the word that I, I spend time on in my classes, in my master classes, is the word can't. Yeah. And I tell everyone, I said, I want you to take the word can't and write it a, a letter and say, dear can't, I don't want you in my life anymore. Mm -hmm. You're holding me back. You're not good for me. You're causing me problems. I will never use you again. And I'm done. And write it and literally put it in somewhere where you can read it. Because can't is dangerous. Right. What if is dangerous? Get out of your own way. Life is a one-time trip. And you need to embrace as much of it in a positive way as possible. Right. And that's been my motto. So being in front of an audience and being afraid left me years ago, right. years ago, because right. I realized I'm going out there. I practice hard. I'm going to do my absolute best to please the people. And hopefully they'll like me, right. but I'm not going to let it define me if they don't. Right, 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 right. No, Ralph, I, 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 
I cannot I cannot add anything to that. This is <laughs> <laughs> this has been such a fantastic, fantastic conversation. Well, um, thank you, brother. Yeah, I, I really, really appreciate you taking the time today. Um I think it it we touched on on a lot of points of interest, a lot of uh thoughts that need to sort of in my at least in my opinion that need to be part of um a musician's thought process or so thought processes let me put it this way um especially nowadays because let me just bring it full circle our business has changed right and <gasps> our 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 environment has changed and therefore we need to change as well and I think that's, that's um, you know, at least that's what I'm hearing from what you're telling me. Um, that has been my assertion from the get-go. I think uh, all of these people that, uh, all of these musicians that I've had on, um, be it Dave Boonshaft, um, I, I had a longer conversation with Victor Wooten about the, the exact same uh, uh, topics as well. Um, it's it, it change is inevitable right change is the only constant in the universe at least that's my belief uh, and therefore it would only behoove us to change with the times um and make ourselves available to as you say to the greatness that 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 we already have inside of us uh, and, and i i don't think that i'm, I'm putting words in your mouth that, no. that that is concerned right so um ralph I want to thank you so much today for 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 making yourself available um anyone who's watching this anyone who is everybody who's listening to this um there are i'm going to put descriptions uh, sorry i'm going to put links to ralph's websites into the description of this video um so you can all contact him uh you can all check out where he is what he plays um all the gigs that I mean, I'm following Ralph on social media, and you would not believe from just from this conversation, you would not believe that this is the same person who's playing to literally 100,000 people with chic. All right. That is like, it, it seems it seems so different. But at the same time, it totally makes sense. <laughs> It's, I hope I make that. Uh, I hope I'm making that clear to the audience. So, Ralph, thank you so much again today for for being here and sharing your thoughts on this. Um, any parting words? Um, yeah, to to everyone who's listening, um, please remember that if right now, if life has not shown this, if you hear anything, that's my stomach growling. Yeah. Uh, if if life has not shown us that how connected we are with with what we're dealing with right now, this uh, we have to embrace every moment right. to understand that as a people, no matter your political views, your religious followings, that we are all connected as a people. Right. You know, it wasn't one person out there that hasn't lost someone to this mm. thing right and we all need each other very much and we all need to understand how fragile this realm is right so help each other be, be kind you know sometimes you know just just try to you know every breathe breath in and breath out is is a gift and right. and and just be kind i mean I wear a shirt called I Choose Empathy right. because that's what this is all about. It's about passing whatever you have forward and opening up the, the thinking to someone else because right. we're humans right. and, we, and we, we're, we're all dying of the same things. Right, right. You know? Right. And I know that I, I hope that sounds like a positive, but it's no, true. no, it's, it's, it, 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 it does. It does. This is not, we're not, we're not leaving the audience with, a big sad note <laughs> no words <laughs> but it's it's so simple to just you know you know just help just help someone who needs help right do right, what right. you know do what you can for someone else and and it will do so much for you yeah just to be kind and and move forward in helping other people most definitely. On that note, listen, yeah. Ralph Roll, thank you so much for making yourself available again. And, um, you know, we are again in the midst of another outbreak, but I hope that at some point we get to see each other again. We got to 
play with each other again. Um, and, um, you know, until then, I wish you and your family all the best. Uh, Thank you. How, can I ask you a question? How's the show doing? You know, the show was doing well. The show was doing really well. Um, of course, we shut down when the shutdown happened. And then in October, we opened back up again, um, only to be shut down in December um, because of the Omicron vari var variant. Um, and while that shutdown happened, um, they, you know, after a number of um, company meetings, they let us know that, yeah, we're going to close it down. So yeah, wow. uh, we're closing down next week, you know, um, today in a week is going to be our last show. Uh, you know, for me, this, this is, uh, the end of, uh, a journey. I mean, obviously I've been a fan of Jameson my whole life. I'm a bass player the, you know, um, uh, without him, we wouldn't have music as it is today. Um, at least that's my opinion. Uh, but, uh, yeah, this is the end of a journey that started. I can tell you exactly when it started in February of 2017. So it's been, you know, a solid five year um, mm. trip, basically, when I first well, got that, that phone call, you know, Cl Clayton is my neighbor. There you go. Okay. Well, Clayton, Clayton lives right around the corner from me. Literally, oh, that's crazy. I could be I could I could walk to his place in like two minutes. That is crazy. And, and Kenny Seymour is um, I'm one of his biggest fans. And he knows that I've watched yeah. Kenny grow. I've literally watched him grow talk about passion mm. i watched him put in the time yeah and and to get to where he is yeah and it's proof that if you get out of your own way there's so many things you could do yeah no doubt mm -hmm. no doubt this uh you know this is my my third show with clayton um i've known clayton for many many years we both met like way before we started playing theater uh jobs uh, and this is my, well, this is also my third show with Kenny now, because we did Memphis together. Um, I've, I've been close to Broadway many times. The first yeah. time was Bringing the Noise, Bringing the Funk, and I there took a go. tour in Japan. Then I was asked um, to to sub on that show, and then the show closed. Mm. Then I was asked by, Ken, um, by Clayton to sub on Memphis, mm. and then the show closed. <laughs> so I didn't ask him if I could sub on Into Private Bank. <laughs> I'm like, there's a, there's a little trend going on here. So <laughs> let, me, let me keep my behind out of Broadway. <laughs> well, listen, you, you, you are going to, you are going to be pulled back in to, to quote that movie. Um, there's, there's no doubt about that. Um, yeah. But yeah, so this is my third show with Kenny as well. Um, you know, as I said, this is the end of a five year endeavor, so to speak, um, that of course, you know, I've kept all the freelance work going, kept all the other gigs going as well. Um, you know, me and my partner, we were able to build this, this, this um, uh, real estate development uh, company and, and all through that time, right? Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it is bittersweet, you know, I, I'm not gonna lie, like it, it, this was a very, this was a once in a lifetime um, endeavor. That's, that, there's uh, well, no doubt, no doubt about that. Well, good for you, and and you know everyone, keep your head up because you know higher ground is coming. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. There's no yeah. doubt about that. All right, Ralph Roll. Once again, you know, there's, there's always there's this trend with these with these videos of of like the prolonged goodbye, <laughs> the 30, 45 minute goodbye, which is a completely different <laughs> conversation altogether. <laughs> <laughs> that happens every time. <laughs> so anyway, Ralph, thank you so much again. Um, I wish you all the best. And um, yeah, everyone out there, check out Ralph Rawl. Um, and uh, I hope to talk to you soon, you know. Yeah, man. As soon as can be. All right. <laughs> That's funny because it's true. It is thank true, you. right? Thank you. Yeah, it's so true, man.